The following interview was conducted with Charles L. Riker, Professor Emeritus of Agronomy for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, June 21st, 2011 at his residence, also sitting in as his wife. This is part two of the interview, and the interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome, and good afternoon to both of you. Thank you. Okay, we'll continue. Um, you think you pretty well covered the international? Okay. I, I, I feel comfortable, and that may come up again. Sure, that's okay. Um, the winter short courses in agriculture. Uh, Purdue was uh, famous for their winter short courses. Some of the other Midwest universities, Big Ten universities, had a w similar type program. But ours um, uh, extended until maybe 20 years ago now. I'm, I've forgotten when it ended. But they started them way back in the early 1900s. And um, the students came here. Uh, they would apply for uh, admission. Um, but the requirements were not too strict because it was an applied eight-week program. And they came here and lived on campus for eight weeks. And I was thinking about this this morning before we were uh, uh, started our inter uh, part two, that um, a lot of the benefit from that program was being there with these, living with these other farmers. They really were farmers for eight weeks, so you would find the ones that you had similar interests. And not only did they learn in the classroom, but they also um, uh, learned from their, their colleagues, and they built up some good friendships. I taught those courses, some of those courses. They could major in animal science, or they could major in agronomy, um, farm management. There were several different options, and I've forgotten now how many courses we had. But we had a lot of courses, so they they could they took like about six or eight courses, and over um, a period of time they come back, or you could no, do it. Uh, during the time they were here. Okay, that we, one segment, that block was. We we kept them pretty busy. Okay, <laughs> you find that with students coming in like that, it's better to monitor, uh, keep keep them busy. Yeah, uh, keep uh, keep them under control, and uh, so. We gave them fairly heavy loads. We didn't expect a lot of, of homework out of them, although we did give them um, homework, and we had tests, uh, quizzes, and they were graded accordingly. And then they wound up as um, alumni of Purdue University, which they cherished that because that put them in that group. Right. The other big benefit that I experienced from them was that they, they were f made friends with professors in the areas that they worked in and they needed problems. And I received many phone calls during the year and years later uh, from those students that had questions that uh, were in my area of expertise. So it was a fantastic program and uh, two people that uh, uh, had a great deal of, uh, of uh, input into that program was uh, Dean uh, Vern Freeman. Okay and um, his associate director, um, uh, Dr. Fendler, um, we had a, a counselor award on campus that was the uh, Dave Fendler Counseling Award, and I won that one time, and I, I, I was uh, really excited about that because I had a great deal of admiration for him as well as uh, uh, Vern Freeman. And, uh, I served as chairman of the Winter Short Course Committee for uh, a number of years, <clears throat> and Dean Freeman always sat in with us and, and uh, had input and really took a, a keen interest in that program. So, uh, a great deal of the success, uh, I'm convinced, was uh, directly uh, due to his interest and, and input. Right. And as a staff member, knowing he was interested, kind of generated more enthusiasm and interest on the part of the professor because this was another assignment that we had in January and February. So at that time, the fall semester ended in January and the yeah. spring semester started in February. So it was not a convenient program <laughs> for the professors. It was for the, the sure. student. Right. But um, I, I enjoyed it and I made some good friendships there and... and uh, uh, why, why did it end, do you know? 
to the well, airport? Well, I think it's it, lack of demand. Okay. Because uh, I'm trying to think how many students we had. We probably had 100, maybe to 150 under good times. And uh, uh, it used to be that if you had a 160-acre farm, uh, you had a big farm. Maybe it was an 80-acre farm. So there were a large number of farmers and young men that wanted more education, right. practical applied education. And now, if you got a thousand acres, you're, you're, you're kind of a small time farmer and some of them have quite a few thousand. And so there just isn't the population the out there. And then I think that, that fewer, there's fewer opportunities for the kids to stay on the farm and then more of them choose to go to college and, and go into a different profession. profession. So um, I'm sure if the demand was there, we'd have continued. We'd have continued. Right. Did they have a special fee for the, for the class? Yes, they did, okay. and it, it was nominal okay. for those days. And they stayed on campus. Uh, yeah. They would find some place uh, amongst the dorms that they could put in 100 students or so. They ate on campus. and. Um, they even had evening programs. One of the professors I remember was a musician, and they had a, a small group of, of uh, musicians from these farm boys uh, that uh, performed. A little and, program and, there, huh? Yeah, it well, was socializing. Yeah, it was it was really neat. Good. But, uh, that sounds good. Yeah. Let's talk about some of the committees that you run. Um, that international ag option. That I guess today would be like study abroad, wouldn't it be? Um, that committee. Yes, or but the, the international um, ag. ag option was more uh, for undergraduates that were trying to direct their undergraduate training towards some type of a career in agriculture. So you tended to take the international courses and, and we would try to get them involved in some uh, short-term overseas assignments mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. I think they still have that program. Right, okay, what about? Uh, that was a fun one for me to uh, participate in. I worked on that one as well as the um, winter short course. And then I had, uh, uh, for 10 years, was uh, in charge of the um, uh, co-op program where okay. they actually had to spend four terms um, out working. They, on rare occasion, we might have one that was on campus that would do something for a semester or take a semester off. And so they would have to put in, oftentimes they worked as a semester in the summer or summer in the fall semester. And I had um, usually about 35 students in that program. Um, as far as just helping students um, develop their career, it probably was the most satisfying, gratifying program. Um, I knew the company representatives yeah. very well. And it got to the point after a few years that <laughs> they kind of depended on me. It, to get it, some students. For more input than I really wanted to give, you know. Right. Uh, <laughs> had a good contact. Huh? <laughs> I well, hear you. Walt Disney in, in Florida would not hire a student from Purdue without Chuck Riker's approval. And even when I moved into the international programs in agriculture and was out of it, they would still call me. And then I didn't know the students. And I said, well, give me a day or two now to do the investigating, and I'll get back with you. Right. What sort of work would they do with the down in Orlando? Well, they, they have, um, what's the name of that program? They have a big program that is applied to plant growth. Um, a professor from Purdue went down there to head that up. That's okay, uh, but there was something related. Yes, yes, related. Okay. it was, it was strictly a, an agriculture program, and right. so That's they had um, uh, several interns from uh, college students uh, during that period, and it was fantastic experience for the college students. Sure, so it's a good good contact. Mm -hmm. um, and the university committee, you do served on the uh, faculty affairs and educational policy. <laughs> I, I, Those are standing you, committees for a yeah, long time. I, 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 <laughs> um, I, I guess it's okay to say that uh, 
uh, committee work wasn't my most exciting work, and you probably heard that There's from others. others. Right. We all knew that it was yeah. our duty, and uh, we are called. Know, <laughs> when when you're involved in the uh, winter short course, you, you're the best person to work on that committee. If you're in the co-op program, you're the best person sure. to be involved in right. that university wide. And I was in the registrar's uh, committee. One committee that. Um, I really enjoyed that I would like to serve more on was readmissions committee. Mm -hmm. um, it's a difficult one because these are students that have been dropped and then <laughs> want, to, want to come back. And so you get into some very interesting situations and, and some of them really disappoint you with the integrity and so forth that they've used in trying to be readmitted and others you really admired that they went somewhere else, took courses, got good grades, and earned right. an opportunity to, to come, come back. back. Right. Um, and um, uh, th there were a lot of committees within the department. Sure. Uh, I was uh, chairman of the awards committee uh, for an extended period of time. That was a good experience for me for promoting students. Right. And, and you um, served on the on the promotion committee too. Oh yes. Assume, yeah. Once once you were a, a associate professor, everybody that was associate and full professor in the department was on the promotions committee. Okay. That's something that we took very seriously, and uh, um, you didn't want to miss those meetings. Or, you know, if you were out of town or something, then it was not possible. But. Uh, we took that very seriously, and we kind of mentored our assistant professors and kind of helped guide them so they would be successful. Because right. uh, you right. don't want to hire somebody and then lose them after three or That's four right, years. That's right, exactly. Got a lot invested in, and they do too, you know. So yes. it works both ways. And I, I was chairman of the graduate committee. In your department? A number, yeah, uh -huh. Yes. And that was interesting because we... We got an incredible number of uh, applications from international students, mm -hmm. as well as the ones within the department. And um, every application that we got that was approved, it'd be approved by the graduate committee first. And so any student that came to us was approved to come to Purdue University if, if we wanted to select them. Uh, because uh, when you get to graduate school, if an international student, if they didn't have um, financial assistance, we did not accept them. And uh, we accepted one out of six applications on international students. But uh, uh, that was an uh, interesting uh, experience. And I went through a period, let's see, it was in the 60s and probably late 60s that we started putting students on committees and so forth. And uh, so we wound up, I was chairman when we first, we first started that, and we had two of our grad students on our committee. This is on a graduate committee? Yes. Uh -huh. And that kind of slowed us down. Um, I could understand why we have them there, but there's so much that they don't understand that you have to explain to them. So it took more patients at that time, I, I don't know. I assume they probably operate the same sure. way. Yeah. But uh, uh, that was an interesting period of going through that there were big changes as far as our right. committee was concerned. Right. So I did my share of committee work. I think so. Uh, let's talk about the department. Of course, you had an anniversary a couple of years ago. And then, of course, the big head that everybody talks about is Professor Peterson. He was the head when you came. 60, 48 to 71. Wow. He was a, just um, a People very can... unusual man, um, and this wasn't any particular secret. You know, when he screened for a new staff member, first thing he screened on academics, and as he would always say, there's a lot of smart people out there. You know, and then he would start talking, making phone calls to his colleagues and so forth, and, and find individuals that... Um, got along well with their colleagues and maybe be involved in, in interdisciplinary research because um, we were crops and soils and 
insects and diseases and all of these types of things affect our crops. So sure. we need to work a lot. And as I mentioned on my research, I was interdisciplinary because mm -hmm. of working with animal science and entomology in particular. And so he, he selected fantastic scientists. He spent a lot of time in the selection process. Yes. Recruiting, okay. And um, <laughs> of course, and that was way before they did the whole process. It's different with search committees and yes. things. You know, yes. Now it's all changed. We, you know, uh, it would be a little unfair to say that they didn't have a search committee because oh, sure. he, he had certain staff members oh, yeah. that But would, the, the structure is a lot different. Than exa he made the decision. That's right. Yeah. Right. And now the, the, the faculty still can make the decision, and the dean or whoever is above doesn't have to select that right. one, and we've been <laughs> been through yeah, that. So it's a whole different time. Uh, yeah, uh, but um, he was uh, he was a farm boy from Oregon. He had a brother, and I don't remember the brother's handicap, but the brother didn't go to school. So he would go to school, and then he'd come home at night and teach his brother the course material in grade school that he had. And so he educated his brother, and I think that gave him uh, somewhat of a rare compassion for people and yeah. helping people. And another interesting tidbit is that we moved from 1960 from Penn State University here uh, to start the 1st of February. And when we came back, do you know where we stayed? We stayed at the department head's house. He, he'd known us see, from being a grad student there, and he says, well, you, you just come on and stay with us so you can move into your university oh, housing. Nice. And that's kind of almost unheard of. You oh, know? yeah. And so, and he kept the, the department more as a family rather than an isolated group of right. 70 individuals. And now, you know, I talked to some colleagues that are somewhere else and they said, oh boy, I guess it's just not like Purdue. You go down the hall and all the doors are closed and nobody talks to anybody. And at Purdue, your door was open and, and the department head, he'd come down and he, he, he liked to drink Cokes. They had little six or eight ounce Coke bottles at that yeah, time. Yeah. He'd go get him a Coke and he would, as he was walking back, he would stop in somebody's sure. office, say, what's going on, and that sort of thing. Right. And so he, he, he really kept in touch with the faculty. And um, he had incredible insight into uh, a lot of things. And you know, you talk about the awards, and I remember one time we had a faculty meeting and there was some discussion of the choice yeah. <laughs> of the person for the award. And I assume that a Purdue person didn't win it, but yeah, that, that's somewhat irrelevant. But he says, well, you have to keep in mind that the award is given for the publicity of the organization. They want, they're, pub they're publicizing their organization. And um, uh, so when you look at it that way, they, they want somebody to publicize. To them, it's not that critical like it is out here. You beat me out for that award, yeah. and so I'm mad. Yeah. <laughs> I understand, and, right. And, you know, nicely said. So you kind of look at it a little bit differently then, sure. you know? Okay, Which is good. a good point. It is. It, right. It's fantastic. So he just had this insight to make things run smoothly, <coughs> understand why we do what we do, and he was good about explaining that sort of thing. <coughs> and um, he had opportunities to go elsewhere and move up here. And he felt obligated, you know, this was a personal decision that he made, that he was going to stay. He felt obligated to us. And, uh, you know, that makes you feel pretty good, too, if you were there. So he was just, uh, I almost get too emotional talking Yeah, that's a nice person. <laughs> uh, what about in those days, uh, do they have advancement or development? Probably, it's not different, it's a lot different than today in the department. You had, did you have donors or oh. fundraising? Um, yeah, you're, you're, you know, kind of fundraising sort of thing. Uh -huh. um, it is 
completely, completely different. When when I started to, to uh, University of Illinois and uh, into grad school, that would have been in 1951, um, the um, there was a dean, and then there was the uh, director of the experiment station. And when the land grant college concept was developed, there was money given not for only for academics, for, but for agricultural research. And so quite a few million dollars came to the director, and then he doled out the money. You come and, to the institution, to the school. Yes, yes. And then um, 30, 40 years ago, was money became uh, tighter, um, and they tended to cut their budget, just like the state. Our tuition now, yeah. do we get 20% from the state? I don't know what it is. I it's think not that a lot. Not much. I know. Yeah. It, it's a small fraction of it. Yeah, right. So what do you do? You have to raise the money yourself. Sure. Now, with tuition, you can raise the tuition. When it comes to research, I know one professor from, uh, I think he was in physics. My son worked for him. University of Nebraska offered him a full-time research position. His professor. Mm -hmm. But no money. He had to raise it all for his salary and all of it. He went there. He went there. But he had to raise it all. And, you know, in... At one time, I remember, and I won't say what department, but one of our departments in the School of Agriculture, he wanted every professor to try to raise the funds to pay their own salary. Whew. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting little scenario, yeah. huh? Yeah. So right. that, and now in our departmental newsletters each week, you'll see some grants, and a lot of times it's $1,000 from... Yeah some turf company that gives you a thousand dollars or and that helps out sure. because uh, maybe you can hire some student for a little right. work for you a little bit or uh, buy some supplies that you need but um, and this has made it um, a different environment for the professors and a lot of faculty don't like that and uh, our oldest son got his PhD at uh, Cornell University in Chem Engineering, and he took a job at Sandia Labs in Albuquerque, which is a essentially a I can't say it's a federal research lab because it's not, but it's a research lab that is uh, funded from the Department of Defense and various other government, government agencies. Uh, agencies. And he went there because he didn't want to have to write proposals to raise money all the time. And talking to him in recent years, now he's back to, he's writing proposals now too. So he could have been a professor. He, he loves what he's doing. Sure. He loves what he's Interesting. doing. Interesting. But um, it's, you know, even in city government and so forth, I see where uh, they apply for a grant from the state or the federal or and a lot of the things that's being done is from grant right, money. Right, right, yeah. Let's talk about some of your awards. Um, the Coach of the Year for the National Rifle and then the best of the best of the agriculture professors at North American Colleges and Teachers. That's very nice. And you got the Special Boilermaker Award and the Agronomic Achievement Award at Purdue Homecoming. Um. And you have others, too. It, and the medallion is nice, both. You've got one from Portugal and also from Poland. Did you have a trip? Did you go over there to get it? Uh, no, I didn't. I got it uh, on when I, on assignment before I left. Oh, okay. Um, the, That's very nice, though. The, the two... Do you want to get the crack on one? Um, the, please. Um, the work... When you go working with an international university and they kind of request you, they really treat you nicely, and, and you, you, Eileen oftentimes was with Matt, and it was fantastic. And um, at University of Everett, I actually taught there one semester. Um, While you were there on assignment? Yes, uh -huh. yes. And, um, you know, I was gonna go out to look at two professors, they were both women, oh, um, uh, at their research plots. And so we were to meet in the lobby at 10 o'clock or something like that. And 
I, I said, um, yeah, I'm ready to go. And they said, well, we can't leave till we get rid of this foreigner. <laughs> and I started laughing. I said, well, you need to get rid of this foreigner. I'm a foreigner. And they said, no, 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 oh, you're different. Uh, and you're here to help us. The, the foreigner that was there was from Denmark trying to sell some kind of lab equipment to them. <laughs> and, you know, so when, when you have that kind of interaction with them, and when, when I left the University of Evra, the president of the university and about six or eight of the faculty that I worked with, they had a last supper for me, real formal. It was, it was incredible, really nice. things that you don't experience very often. Yeah. And so um, the two awards from, and, and I like to mention historic universities because they're both centuries old. And uh, so... Yeah, the one in Krakow, right. Yeah, and the one in um, in Evra went back to the 1600s or so, and they have old classroom as as a kind of a museum. It's a square room like they were with the wooden walls, and then the pulpit or the professor that stood up on a right. little stand, and then the there was benches around the wall, and that was a classroom. And I would go in there and go up on the and this little stand and kind of pretend that I was teaching my class <laughs> from there. So it, 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 there were it, and there were so many it, it, Krakow was right there at Auschwitz. I never I, I never could get up the courage to go yeah. visit there. Right. I, I saw it from a distance. We went into the salt mine there uh, and that was fantastic and one of the professors, he took us there. He stayed in his car and worked on his uh, homework while we were in there several hours. And uh, so it, it those those experiences were Very priceless. Let me tell you, how did you, uh, did they tell you in advance about the Agri Agronomic Achievement Award or did you just be there? You know, I knew in advance. Okay. I knew in advance. And that so one was- Same were the Boilermaker too? Did you know that in advance, that you were gonna get it? Yes. Okay, it, yes. That it, I think you have to, because you have to be at the game. And yeah, all well, yeah. it we had, a competition that day at, at Bloomington and you know, trap and skeet, and so oh. I sent the um, the team on yeah. ahead, and I think there was one kid that stayed with me, and then as soon as I got my award, and it was on national TV, then I jumped in the car and went down to Bloomington. I see that man on the jumbotron. He's leaving the stadium <laughs> <laughs> as fast as he can. <laughs> He's got uh, his award and running. Well, right? you know, I think I was the first professor to get that award. Because one of my colleagues says, Chuck, you know, professors aren't supposed to get that award. That's not for professors. And if you go back and look at them, there are a lot of people that work in library dormitories and sure. service to the students. And uh, uh, my trap and ski team is the one that put in my nomination. And um, so, yes, I knew that ahead. And the homecoming award was, was kind of special because these all my colleagues were there. from years past were there. Did they give it to you at the school, at the build in Lily, or? We had a, um, or did you have a the, the department had a tent set up there in the middle of campus for their alumni to come back, and they had somewhat of a, um, a, a formal program that the department had made some comments and, and made some awards, um, and then it was just an opportunity for all the alums and the faculty and so sure. forth to get together and uh, um, that's really nice there were their students there from almost my first year of teaching here oh wonderful Gerald Gentry I don't know whether you know that name or not but he's been very active on the alumni and uh, he's done very well uh, career-wise and he was there and so it's it's really that's a perfect opportunity to do with oh, all yeah. those back and your students I mean it just Lenses. That's the way it should be. People yeah. that you've known and worked with and kept in touch with over yes, the years. Yes, so that forth. was very right. rewarding. Um, any professional associations that you, you know, any offices in any of them, or? Well, um, I was a member of uh, an awfully lot of oh, professional imagine, organizations, yeah. and you almost feel like it's your duty uh, to be a member. Not do anything doesn't help them that much mm -hmm. either. And the American Society of Agronomy is the top one as far as my profession is concerned. 
and I need to check and see, but I will reach my 60th year within, because I started in the early 50s, and so within the next year, two or three, they keep track of it. Sure. And uh, um, I'm a fellow of that organization. Uh, I don't and know. And you're a fellow of the Crop Science Society. Right? Crop Science right. Society. And the Indiana Academy of Science. Indiana Academy of Science. And I, I, I work closely. The Indiana Academy of Science, some people would say, well, Chuck, that's not prestigious enough. You know, they go work in the national organizations. But you can take a, uh, they, they, their program is one day. These others will be a week, so you mm-hmm. got to take a whole week off as a professor. But um, I tried to have every one of my grad students give a paper at that in the, in the at the at, at annual meeting. Okay. And um, so I, I felt very close to that organization, and and it, I can you know think of several students that started out and became highly successful and so forth, and that's where they got their start, and they remember that and then tell me that. Right. Well, it's starting on a little bit, not as large, and they get, they can make contacts. You're exactly right, and and, and they learn what is, what it's all about. Um, you know, when somebody's new and comes in an organization, they got to do a lot of observing and and asking questions to really know what to expect. Sure, right. And this was a, a, a good place to learn. And you gave your paper in a room that may not be any bigger than this area is here, and you don't feel so intimidated as getting up with a microphone and um, a thousand people out there. So I know what you're saying. One time there was a luncheon that I was at. It was on campus, and they had the luncheon. It was a Dean's Club luncheon for an engineering, and I was invited. The luncheon was on the stage of Elliott Hall of Music, and it was really kind of cool, you know? And you look out, and you can just, nobody else was sitting there, but that's that's a big group, and people experience that, so I know what you're saying. It was kind of neat. <laughs> well, uh, the, there was one career award that we haven't mentioned, which was the American Forage and Grassland Council Career Award for a distinguished grasslander. Uh, and then we had a state chapter. That was the national. Then there was an Indiana Forage Council, and... Uh, I was a charter member of that, and we met probably off and on for a year before we organized that group. And the state so group. Huh? I was yes, and so I was very active, uh, held a number of offices, and and I still maintain my membership. Not that I attend, but I like to read and see sure. what's going on, and right. and my dues help support them a little bit. Right. So uh, that's good. Now the hobbies and special the trap and ski. Oh. Um, and the new book that you've just <laughs> issued, which is nice. Well, Passion brings. It's, it's kind of hard to know, and maybe we'll start with Trap and Skeet. Uh, my hobbies I consider to be guns, and of course that goes with the Trap and Skeet. Sure. And um, uh, then uh, I'm a motorcycle enthusiast, believe it or not, and uh, I've never had an accident in a, on a motorcycle. I had one in a car. And uh, uh, I'm a baseball, particularly a Cub fan. Been a Cub fan since 1938. I'm starting to think about reincarnation because we're not going to win a World Series, I don't think. It's been over 100 years, and so that's the mentality of the Cub fans. And then um, I really enjoy genealogy to the point where I'd almost rather do that than some of the other things. So I kind of put that on a back burner, thinking someday when I'm not able to move around and do a lot of things, I can sit at my computer and, and work on that. But the, 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 the trap and skeet success really came about because of my interest in shooting. And um, a lot of people may not understand this, but you... The students find out if they have an interest in shooting, they'd come, they'd know, well, I'll go see Dr. Riker and he can remember to tell you. So where can I go to shoot? Where can I go to shoot? Right. And uh, uh, I'm going to mention this now because I don't want to forget it. But we organized the Trap and Skate Club. That We have 35 club guns, university guns. And when we first got organized, got a range and a clubhouse and the guns there and everything, the fire department and the police department and the various people would come out there on runs and we had our big first aid kit and everything. And 
you know, knowing that they're going to be on call out there and we've got to know where the place is. I was told a year ago uh, at homecoming that the Purdue Trap and Skeet um, uh, club sports, that, but even varsity, they're the only Purdue sports that have never had an injury in practice or in competition. And I think the original uh, first aid kit in a big red box is still sitting out there that I don't know that's ever been opened. Mm -hmm. For a while, they would come out and inspect it annually and, and update it. But uh, so. Uh, how did you, how was the site selected? And not easily. Okay. Because. Um, when the club was formed, then you had to find a site or. Yes. Um, we started uh, students and I, and, and I, we had no idea this was going to happen. Sure. But one of my advisees, he, he wanted to shoot shotguns. All they had was a rifle pistol. And so he, he joined that and we knew the other kids that enjoyed shotguns. And in 77, he got elected president of rifle pistol. <laughs> so he took the rifle pistol money and sent our shotgun shooters to the national championship in Peoria. Well, that got him ejected from the rifle. Well, I don't know that it's really that serious, but that didn't go over very well. But we knew we had enough support to form our own club. So uh, I still have a copy of this, September 12th, uh, 1978. And I think it's a copy of that new book. Um, we were officially uh, designated as a club sport. And um, the only thing I can say about our early days is the fact that we got beat like drums. You know, we fought three of the five on our team, this team that we took to the first competition, had never shot at a clay target before. But we came in, I think, third. They were good hunters, they were good shooting hunters. And so we had a lot of enthusiasm and interest, and it just it was coincidentally at that time, President Hansen was a skeet shooter. He had reloading equipment in the basement of his house. I remember going there, and I thought, boy, this is really neat. He reloaded his own shotgun shells and shot skeet. And um, uh, Dr. George Hannaford was uh, director of um, recreational sports. His son, was a trap shooter. He was a school teacher up north of here. I think he's retired now, but uh, he he was a trap shooter. So these individuals knew that it was a safe sport if it was monitored directly and everything, that it, there was no uh, danger there. And so um, we started looking for a site. In, he, Dr. Hannaford had the students, uh, he would give us suggestions and we'd go look and whatever. And we would just about get someplace and we would go out and start clearing it off and so forth and the neighbors would get together and send a petition to President Hansen that... that uh, and you also it. wanted, I imagine, something not too far from campus either for the oh, students. It, it, it's perfect. Yeah. It's perfect. It's just a couple of miles on some yeah, river. But you, when you're looking at sites, you don't want anything that's too far away. No, no. Uh, and, See, that's a problem before. We had to go to Indianapolis to shoot skeet or Kokomo. We could go out to Mulberry on Friday night and shoot trap. And so every Friday night we went to oh, okay. Mulberry. But um, once we got onto the gravel pit, it, it's worked out beautifully. It's worked out beautifully for us. And in 82, uh, Dr. Hannaford built a um, superimposed trap and skeet range. You, you can so you can only shoot one or the other. He was going to have uh, them separate, but we're close to the police range, <laughs> and we didn't want any possibility of any shot falling on the police. So we moved it there. We have since constructed another one on the other side. We had to do some fill, but we got that uh, done ourselves. We got the money and so forth to do that. And then we put a trap range over here where we didn't put it before because the angle is such that you, you aren't going to drop any uh, shot on the police range. And once we got our own range, then every weekend we were out there practicing, and that was in 82. 83, we tied for the Big Ten Championship, and we were happy. 
and we lost the shoot off. Our best shooter had a broken collarbone and was competing anyway. And he, so you have your best shooter from each team in a shoot off. Well, we lost that one, but we, we could handle it. In, in 84, we won the Big Ten Championship and we won that for 20 years in a row or so. In 85, we won our first collegiate world championship in trap with the Grand American. And we won th that world championship 20 consecutive times. You know, just getting, getting the team there is one thing. To win a world championship is something else. And then we've had 17 of our shooters named All-American. This is the All-American book on rifle, pistol, and shotgun. And I just got it out this morning and was looking through there. Sure. You know, here's my picture in there and all of our 17 shooters. And uh, Purdue well represented there. Uh, but uh, that was uh, fantastic. And uh, what happened was as we became more and more proficient, we have three children, two sons and a daughter. They all went to Purdue University and got bachelor's and master's degrees. Mm -hmm. And so they learned to shoot trap and skeet too. So we all went and uh, uh, our two sons won four, were each on a, uh, four world championship teams. And our daughter was on 14 uh, national and world championship, either as an individual or uh, as a team member. And then she got a master's degree here then her husband went to Edmonton, Alberta on a postdoc. He got his PhD here in chemistry. He was a rifle shooter from Pennsylvania. And um, so she competed as, as a Canadian student in the same national championship that we do. And she won, she, she's won the um, national championship, collegiate national championship, both for the United States and for Canada. And I was her coach when she was in oh, Canada too. So, and then she went on to get on the U.S. national team. There's three women, top three skeet shooters are on the U.S. women's team. And she was all American as an adult on, as, that, as a team member. And she competed in World Cups and uh, Grand Prix uh, and she, won the gold medal at the championships of the America, two gold medals. Uh, she was the top lady and she won by five targets, which is almost unheard of. And that's half the world. She was champion of half the world. She, in that same year, she was the top lady in the United States and went to the world championships. We have the, the Olympics essentially is held every year, but every fourth year we call it the Olympics. And so she was there in 201 she wound up 13th in the world. And uh, you know, you'd like to think you did better than that. There were 42 there, so um, we were happy with that. And uh, so um, I was considered an Olympic coach too, since I coached and I could stay out to the Olympic Training Center. Uh, and uh, we did that uh, until 2008, but when we're traveling around to all these national championships, they have junior high kids, high school and college and so forth. And so I knew all these top shooters, junior All-Americans or U.S. development team. And I knew their parents because their parents were there with them. And uh, some of the parents were uh, college professors. Some of them were doctors and some of them. Mm -hmm. uh, trap and skeet are not cheap sports. so. Mm -hmm. it, better have a little money to buy your $10,000 gun. And um, so I would talk to them and then I would tell them our opportunities and uh, recruited the top, top students. Yeah, they were really good. And two thirds of the way through writing my book is where the title came to me one day, Passion. Yeah, for the research. Because they passion, had brilliance that passion for shooting. Right. Brilliance. Because they were all top students. And then athleticism. Well, you gotta match that gun barrel sure. speed with the target speed, and so it's a hand-eye coordination, and so that title 
uh, came to me that uh, we had one student that called me during the 1998 Olympics. He was in California and I, I knew who he was. I had been to shoots with him and everything and he had been going to college but he hadn't been highly successful and wasn't very happy. And he, I was lying on the couch in there because I just had my nose broken and reset from a childhood accident. And uh, he said, uh, Chuck, I want to come to transfer to Purdue University. And I think that was about the 28th of July or so. And I says, okay, Damon, um, we can get you in January, all right. Oh, no, no, he says, I want to come this fall. And I says, wow. I says, I says, I'm going to hang up and let me see what I can do. He already had three world championship rings in his pocket. Three world championship rings. Fantastic shoot. And so I ran in to talk to one of my colleagues in the Ag Counseling Office and said, who can I go to over in the admissions office to talk about getting a student in this fall yet that won't throw me right out of the office? Because I knew what I was going to be asking. He says, okay. He says, I know a person. So he gave me the name. And about 10 after 1, it was 12.30 when he called me. 10 minutes after 1, I was in her office and talking to her about the situation. And, of course, the first thing she says, well, there's no rooms available. And I said, well, he's going to stay with my wife and me. And she says, well, okay. And so as we went along, I had an answer for everything. And I, I told her everything about the situation. And um, she said, okay, uh, here's the forms, and you send him the forms. And I said, well, how am I going to know that these are going to come back to you so that you know? She said, well, I'll just put my name and stuff. And so I had that, went back to my office, International Program in Agriculture. I faxed him to his dad. His dad had um, low-income housing, uh, to people, and, and the kid was there. And at 10 minutes after 4, <laughs> yeah. the, the faxes, yeah, the application yeah. was completed with the um, transcripts, which weren't legal, though, but they would help to sure. get him admitted. And so I jumped up, ran over to her office, and handed them to her that day. And so we got, we got him admitted fairly soon, as soon as we got the official transcripts and everything. And then I had to get him, a, a get him registered. And he was in California. He was going to be an RHI, and so um, I knew that a lady, the head lady over there, can't think of her name now. We were on a number of committees together. She was out of town. So I went over there and asked for it. So I got second in command. Joanne's her first name. I've forgotten her second name now. And I talked to her about what I was wanting to do, and she didn't give me much encouragement. She says, "Oh, I have never registered a student that I didn't talk to one on one." And I said, well, he's in California. The class is going to start soon. And so then I said, what I've done is gone, I, I said, I've registered a lot of students. I've gone to your catalog and looked at the courses and so forth. And I've filled out this registration form for you. She looked at it, looked at it, and said, that's exactly what I would have done. All set. And so <laughs> about a day before classes started, he showed up in Indianapolis, went and got him, and he stayed here, I think, three days. And after the first day or so, he said, Chuck, let's go look for rooms. And so we couldn't find anything. We went across the bridge, Harrison there, in one of those new apartments going up. It was almost done. He said, let me go and talk to him, because his dad ran this kind of business. Sure. He came back out, and he says, I can move in tomorrow. It wasn't done, but it was done enough that they would let <laughs> him move in. It. And so... Uh, and I've forgotten how many world championships he won for us. But the rewarding thing, um, Catherine, was that the parents, the family came here for graduation. And after commencement, they met over at Mountain Jacks. And we were invited. And this was an Armenian family. And the father sat at the head of the table. And we all sat down there. And he sits there. He says, I never thought this day would come. I was against Damon coming to Purdue University, and he, oh no, no, anyway, it was it was, you know, just to sit there and hear that was was fantastic. I bet, yeah. Because the the kid never had put his 
effort into schoolwork like he did shooting. And I knew who he was going to be with. This was a close-knit group that we had. And he was on the dean's list. He was on the dean's list. He just needed to come here and worked out. He had to get in the right environment to motivate right. him to right. put his priorities on studying as well as shooting. Right. And so that was very nice. And one thing, the reward for the coach was one time I was somewhere within hearing distance and somebody says, hey, Damon, you going to shoot this weekend? And his response was, I do whatever Dr. Reichard wants me to do. <laughs> <laughs> and, That's a, and I didn't go expose myself to him or let him know that I was there or anything. I just, <laughs> that's fantastic. But I knew that. Sure. I knew that. How about a Purdue tradition? Is there one that comes to mind for you? Um, you know, I thought about that one for a while. And this might kind of surprise you, but we're both very loyal to Purdue, I know. But um, I was faculty marshal at commencement for a decade or so. I had, you know, served in that capacity from the department occasionally, sure, right. and um, there's only one faculty marshal, and I knew the person that was there, Jack Long, was there ahead of me, and so I just kind of watched when he stepped down, and I don't remember now the maneuvers to, to do that, but I did that, I go to all four, I go to all four of them, and it, it, in May, there were sure. was, was there two in August, one in Maybe one in August, two in December, I forgot. Right. But everybody is happy. You know, and when I had several uh, several times I had students say, are you going to graduation? No, I'm not going. Oh, you're making a real mistake. I had talked to them for a while. And then they would come, and then I'd get a letter. And it's, it's a very impressive ceremony. I have been to a lot of graduations, but we've been able to maintain the, the dignity and the respect the, and the personal individualized is what really does such a you know really so um, uh, to me without doubt uh, that was just as, as, as a happy sort of, of uh, I've had obviously a, a, a lot of, of very exciting rewarding times but right. that one was just always pure pleasure that's right a lot of si uh, similar I've heard from quite a few people that they really like commencement yeah. uh, and around the stage or the shaking hands or the just yeah. and it's great you know it really is I would always try to get me on the end of the rope because I knew where the egg students were going to come down through yeah. and so I'd be there with the grand right. <laughs> shake their hands as they go by sure so they'd always kind of I didn't expect to see you here <laughs> <laughs> how about an outstanding event do you have one that you'd like to share with us? Um, there could be more than one. Some people well, you know, um, you've had a lot. It, it, nothing ever compares with getting married and having okay. a successful mar marriage. And Sunday was our 57th wedding anniversary, and that sort of thing in the family that, that we've had. But um, just purely on a surprise, an achievement, and something that you hadn't expected. When I got a call in 1991 that I was the um, national coach, shooting coach of the year. I had gotten the award in my profession as the ag, agricultural professor of the year. I don't know of anybody else that's ever won both an award in their profession as well as uh, in coaching or some other area. I, I'm sure that others have, but uh, um, that one almost uh, blew me off the chair. and. Uh, um, I knew the other coaches. I was, those, those are varsity coaches. Rifle pistol is all varsity, and some shotgun is varsity. Ours was a club sport, so you had to beat out all the varsity right. teams to get that. So um, I would have to put that one. Yeah, that sounds good. As, uh, Very good. Yeah. Um, retirement activities. <laughs> Book. I know. Well, you know, You've every once busy. in a while we get so busy. I tell my wife, I think I'm go, going to go back to work so I get my life a little more organized so that, you, you know, you think maybe you have a day off. Because what's going to happen, Catherine, is when you reach retirement, then you've got control of your time. Right. And um, I mentioned all of my hobbies and the genealogy, and I still do research. Um, and I think I mentioned to you, I'm in my seventh right. decade now of publishing scientific journals. And Good. Um, I, I, I enjoy that and I stay with that. Um, and I've been very active, just returned from Washington, D.C. on Sunday from our annual meeting for um, the 
uh, collegiate shooting programs, and um, uh, have a lot. we do a lot of babysitting for um, our grandchildren. Uh, so life is very good, and uh, I kind of think about what I can procrastinate on for a little while till I get. We're in the process now of trying to downsize our house and and get things in in order so that uh, um, the the day will probably come when we move into a retirement home, and uh, so uh, if we had to do that tomorrow. It would be chaos. <laughs> <laughs> Any, uh, I'm going to leave it to you. Anything that I forgot to ask or in closing? That well, it was um, one um, with the family and with the children uh, that we got to compete and win national and world championships in trap and skeet. The other area, they all went to Purdue University and got bachelor's and master's degree. We, our family has 11 degrees from Purdue University. And um, we got started working on, with my middle son, on artificial intelligence research, applying artificial intelligence to crop management. And with, with, with artificial intelligence, you have a person that's a knowledge engineer that does the programming on the computer. You have another person that is the domain expert that knows what we're trying to solve. And so I was the domain expert and our son Rob started out, um, the reason I got into this was that the director of the experiment station told me in a, my annual review that I should be thinking about applying artificial intelligence techniques to my research. And of course you want your project approved so you indicate you'll do that. <laughs> and. Within a couple of months, I got a mimeograph coming across my desk about an artificial intelligence course in agriculture. It said that if you're going to enroll in the course, you have to have a domain expert, a professor that's willing to work with you. I thought, well, I got the professor. I don't have a student to take the course. And I couldn't think of anybody that I knew that my grad students or anything. And then I thought, well, my son's a senior in agriculture. He's an agronomist. I was just going to ask him to do this and he did and so we took the course and the, you had a project in the course that you had to develop an expert system in applying it to agriculture and so we started doing this well as, as I started working on this I thought we can publish this this is fantastic so I went to talk to the instructor Don Jones and what used to be ag engineering mm -hmm. and uh, he said sure he says it's quite feasible and so we did that and then we just continued to do that after the class was over. And then his brother was in physics, really good with the computers and so forth, and he helped us on some other uh, uh, problems and projects. And we published these as we went along. And then our daughter was working on a master's degree in ag engineering and uh, actually worked for the professor that taught this course. And uh, so I got her involved, and we wound up, this is kind of unbelievable, but we published 20 scientific journal articles on artificial intelligence. One of the papers was presented at NASA headquarters in Houston, because mm. they use, they're interested in applications of artificial intelligence, they use a lot of it in the space program. And we had one invited chapter of a book that we wrote on the application of artificial intelligence to uh, um, agricultural crop management. And the title was Reichard, 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 and Reichard. M myself Wonderful. and the three kids. Yeah. Wonderful. And so that was real neat. It, it was nice when the kids were going through college because they were on campus. And it usually wouldn't hardly be a day go by that I wouldn't see them sure. somewhere on campus and kind of kept up with what they were doing. and because we were working on this and we were shooting trap and skeet and they were taking their courses and I was doing what I was doing. So it was busy. But uh, um, that's one thing that, I don't know, you call it serendipity, something like that, that sure. we were Sounds there like and it. the opportunities um, arose. 
and um, it just came right off the top, which is great. Yes. Thanks. And and our son that started that is now the department head of agriculture at Illinois State University, Eileen's alma mater. Very so, nice. Yeah. That's Small great. world. And and our daughter Linda, her husband that was a chemistry professor, is also a professor at Illinois State University, the same university, and our two kids live two blocks apart. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Is that the one that was in Canada at one time? Yes. Oh, and then did they did he, he stay he, up there? He or? was there two years. Okay. And then came to um, Bloomington Normal, uh, and he really likes it there, and uh, so um, everybody's very happy. Good. And last year, I don't know where this needs to be in here or not, but um, our son got the American Society of Agronomy Outstanding Teacher Award. First time a non-land grant university professor has won that award and our son in chemistry won out of 29 professors 29,000 professors in Illinois he was selected as a, a it's a case award that each state they give a top professor in right. Washington DC to get his award so um, the teaching continues to very good to evolve it continue the process continues on yeah. Dr. Rockin, I want to thank you and your wife very much for this wonderful opportunity. It's been right. great. Yeah. Really enjoy. And I got something for you two. Oh, uh,